My name is Farrell Livingston. I'm conducting an oral history interview with Deborah Kirby at the Hanover Square Heritage Center in Winter Park, Florida. The date is October 4th, 2021. In the room with me are Kim Mould, Farrell Livingston, and Jeff Cravero. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to start off, Deborah, with an introductory type question for, uh, about your personal biographic information. You know, who you are, basically where you came from, and just a little background about yourself. And make sure when you, uh, you tell us how to properly spell your name. Okay. My name is Deborah, D E B O R A H. Patricia Kirby, K I R B Y. I was born uh, September the 3rd, 1949, to Alan uh, McCurvey and Raymond Kirby. Alan McCurvey is the uh, daughter of Blanche Brookins, and she was with my grandmother Blanche Brookins when she was uh, put off the train in the lack. At that time, my mother was two years old. I lived the majority of my life in Winter Park, attended schools in, in, in Winter Park. And um, I attended a uh, War Chapel Amy Church, which was uh, founded by my uh, great grandfather, uh, uh, Mr. Slaughter. In 1964, I was uh, one of three students who attended Winter Park High School in 1960. Three, the school was integrated by one black student, and then the next year I attended. Also, in 1967, I entered Florida State University. Um, we were the first class to enter that university of black students as freshmen. I pursued a degree in nursing, and I have a major in nursing and psychology, and I have a minor in child development. Emphasis on uh, ages zero to twelve. I'm currently retired after 42 years of nursing. So, what is your relationship to Washington Strader and his wife Edith? They were my great grandparents. They on my mother's side. So, could you tell us where they were born and something about their early life? Okay. From our from our family history, we we know that uh, Grandpa Strader was born probably in Virginia, migrated to Florida. Uh, Grandma Strother was born up near them in Georgia, near them, uh, in Georgia or in the Madison uh, area. That's basically where she remembers her life, uh, being in Madison as, as a child. She said that basically during that time, um, she was in the house with the, with the children and that's why she learned to read and write. Because when the tutor came to teach the children, she was also in the classroom and she learned to read and write. So Grandma Strader could read and write from an early age. So this was when she was in Madison, Florida. Correct. And she worked in the house of the owners. Correct. And while the tutor uh, worked with the children of the owner, your grandmother learned to read and write. That's right. Now, do you know how they ended up in Winter Park? I know that they got married in Jacksonville, we were all kind of, and I don't know how they ended up. Uh, they came to Orlando, and then from Orlando, I think they were working with Dr. Phillips, and there, I think they moved to Winter Park. What do you know about their education? Well, you, I know did, you told us that your grandmother could read. Mm -hmm. And right. So, what do you know about both of their educations? Grandpa Strader could not read and write. He was he was self-educated in, in in working, doing a building, and working and in, 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 in planting, farming, and what have you. So he could not read and write. But Grandma Strader did. Um, he knew how to do business. He knew how to get abstracts of his property, and she would take care of all of the. Uh, the business part of it, where it entailed the reading and, and, and explain to him what was going on. Now, 
They married in Duval County, but do you have any idea what year they married? Can you tell us when Washington Samson Stroger and Eves Wilson Stroger were married and where? Okay. In Duval County, Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. It was on November the 18th, 1882. And you do have the marriage license for yes, that family? Yes, this is a copy of the marriage license. Okay. Now, um, How many children did they have? They had five children. Can you name them? Mm -hmm. That William. Arthur. William. And they had, we call him Sahidi. They had Blanche, Sophia, Strada, Catherine. Father, and murder squad. That's so two sons and three, three daughters. Okay, so we had William and son Edie. What was his real name? Arthur. Arthur. Okay. Any reason why you all called him son Edie? That was the nickname he was because my grandmother's his mother's name was Edith, so he was the son of Edith. Oh, okay. That's good. Now Of Washington and Edith Stroder's children, Blanche was your grandmother. So Blanche Stroder Brookings was your grandmother. Correct. So Washington Sampson would be your great grandfather. Okay. Could you tell us about your grandfather, Washington Stoller, your great-grandfather, I'm sorry, your great-grandfather, Washington Stoller, and why he could be considered a founding father of Winter Park, especially in historic Hanover Square? Basically, he bought property in, um, in the Hanover Square area where he owned a, a barbershop. He owned, he owned the property where there was a barbershop. He also owned, owned property where there was a pool hall and also a sundry shop along with his property where his house was. And on Lineman Avenue, he basically owned uh, some groves. He had fruit trees and things on that property there. On um, the property where this uh, heritage center is right now, this is where the barn was. And that's basically also where he had a garden back on this property also. The house was across the street where the parking lot is now. So the city of Winter Park parking lot at the corner of New England and Pennsylvania is where his homestead, is that the place of his homestead? Correct, to the, to the right of it. The city owned the piece of land that was basically the public parking lot. But so there was only two pieces, only that parking lot and his house on the whole entire block. So his house was located closer to Lyman Avenue. Right, it was in the center in of the center. property. Center. It was basically between the street that runs here, which is Douglas, okay. which, which, was a, which was, at that time was an alley. Because it was a dirt road up until I was in high school when it was paved. So basically his property sat on um, um, his house set on basically the majority of that block. And what the lot that the city owned at that time, they used to plant, my grandma's daughter would plant uh, flowers on that property. Mm -hmm. So they're basically using the springtime or whatever that it grew. So the homestead for Washington Samson Stroger faced Pennsylvania Avenue? Correct. Can you describe the house to us? Well, it was a two-story house. I grew up in the house. It was a two-story house. Um, at that time, I think there were, what, four bedrooms upstairs. Downstairs, there was a living room, dining room. Um, and what they called 
a parlor. But they, that was a bedroom. The night we went to another, basically five bedrooms in the house. And then the porch that went all the way around. But that was the, that was the second house that was uh, built on that site. The first house was, was burned down sometime, I think, when my grandmother was probably about 16 to 17 years old. She said they had gone to the movies. And when they returned home, the house was, well, they went and stayed in the house. But they had a line added in. They stayed there until they rebuilt the house in Pennsylvania. And my great grandfather said that he wasn't going to let anybody run him out of his house. It was rumored that the Klan came in and burned the house down. And he was not going to let anybody run him away. So he was going to build it bigger and better than it was before. So that basically when the uh, current house, which is in this picture, when that one was built, it was also a two-story house, but it had the columns. The big columns that went all the way around the porch on the other side, which, which the other one didn't have. So did Washington's daughter, did he participate in any, in any government activities? Did, did he, was he involved in any uh, movement to incorporate? Yes, basically, but they, you know, the town was square had their own little community, business area, what have you, right up here in Hannibal Square. He also owned property, which, which is where the YMCA is now, in one park. That was his garden. And that property was taken, I think, at the end of the main. Um, but basically, he did, you know, he did a lot in the community with, with business. He was, uh, making sure that there were businesses, that uh, people had a place to stay, because he also had more property. And he also uh, grew fruit. As a very early land owner in Winter Park, could you again tell us exactly where his original family home was located. You just explained it a few minutes ago. Can you just give us a little more information so if anybody was trying to locate that particular property, how would you describe it to someone who know, doesn't know the area? Okay, I'm going to tell you 317 Pennsylvania Avenue, which if you look at Google it, it doesn't show anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but three, I would tell them that basically it's right in the heart, it's right there on the corner of New England Avenue uh, and Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, in, in that area right there, and it's right in front of where the Heritage Center sits right now. Um, you did mention to us earlier that he owned uh, property on Lyman Avenue and he owned property out where the current uh, YMCA on Lake Mount is. Mm -hmm. Were there any other land holdings that you know of or remember? Not right off. Okay. What did he do for a living? Basically worked the land and, and uh, like I said, he had real property. Mm -hmm. He worked the land, he had fruit growth, so he uh, sold the fruit and uh, lived that way. Did he, did he, um, Sell property to newcomers to Winter Park of, yes, he of, did. of, of color. Mm -hmm. He did. And uh, yeah, I think he had real property also. So how did he build his wealth? How do you think he built his wealth? I think basically through hard work. Basically, he worked the land. That was, you know, he, he 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 worked he worked the land. He bought property. He built houses on on his property. And I think that's basically how he accumulated his wealth, by basically working, letting the land work for him, and then having property that, were, that was business and profitable in that way, and establishing his wealth through, through the real estate and through working the land. So what happened to the last homestead building, the one that he built back bigger and better? That one was torn down. What year? Mm -hmm. I think it was 19, what was it, was it 70, 76 I think it was. Mm -hmm. So who, who took ownership of the property itself after it was torn down? Okay, uh, after it 
after it was torn down before? After it was torn down? Mm -hmm. After it was torn down. Uh, the development company bought it. Okay. And basically, I think they turned it into to a parking lot. I think at that time, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what their plans were for it. Mm -hmm. But now it's still currently a parking lot. Okay. So. You mentioned to us that where the Heritage Center now sits at 642 West New England Avenue, mm -hmm. that this was once the barn of Stowers. Correct. Now, I do recall that one of the heirs attempted to build a house on this site after retiring and returning to Florida. That is correct, and he was told that he could, it was my Uncle Wallace, which is my, my grandmother, Blanche's second child. He was told, grand, Grandmother Edith Strawler left him this property because when Grandpa Strawler died, he came and stayed with her, my grandmother and, 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 my, and my grandfather. And their family was living on slope, and she didn't want to stay in the house by herself, so he came and stayed with her. So when she died, she left him his property. And he was told that he could not build a house on his property because he did not have enough frontage to build a house here. And uh, about four years later is when they built other houses surrounding this area that were a much smaller lot than what his was, but he was told at that time that he could not get it. Could you tell us about Washington and Edith's daughter Blanche and her husband Gilbert Brookings? And what, what is your relationship to these two? They are my grandparents. They are my mother's parents. Um, those are their families. Um, the Strawler family and, and, and the Brookings family were both uh, founding members of Ward Chapel and Church. So that their families were, were close in that relationship. Uh, my, grandpa, uh, my grandfather and, and uh, my grandmother were married in 1919. And at that time they were married, um, my grandfather's parents gave them two lots, two lots of property on, that were on uh, on Canton, the back part of Canton. And my grandmother and my grandfather bought uh, two other lots that they swole so that they wouldn't be on the back part, on the alley part, so that their home would face uh, swole. And that's where they built their home. So what values do you believe your great-grandparents, Washington and Edith, instilled in their children, especially Blanche? to basically stand up for what is right, stand up for what you believe in, be honest, don't let anybody turn you around, and basically to own your own home, to own property, to own your own home. They talk ownership. Could you tell us uh, of a particular time in 1926 where Blanche amplified these values you just shared with us. Yes, it happened in 1926. Um, my grandmother's younger sister, Myrtle, died. She was the, she was the baby of the family. And uh, her sister Catherine was, uh, was upset and couldn't, didn't feel like going back to New York by herself. So my grandmother at the time who was six months pregnant with my Aunt Janet. And my mother, who was two years old, accompanied my aunt to New York and stayed with her for a while. And uh, on the return trip, my grandmother purchased a, a pulling ticket for her and my mother. And so basically, when they were on the return trip, and so over oh, getting to the near the, the Mason and Dixie line, and I think it was somewhere between after they passed the Mason Dixie line that they asked her 
told her she would have to go to the uh, covered car. And she told me, no, I uh, paid for a Pullman, and I'm going to stay here. So when they got to Jacksonville, I, guess, I think that was the first stop after the Mason, he asked her something she had to move, and she said, no, she wasn't going to move. So they called ahead to Palatka, which was the next stop. And when they got to Palatka, they came on the train and arrested her and took her to jail. Because she refused to give up her Pullman seat, a, 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 a Pullman car. So they arrested her and took her to jail, along with my mother, who was two years old at the time. When they um, got to the jail, her grandmother said they didn't, um, she said it was an older cop and a, and a younger officer. And she said they, uh, when they got to the jail, he didn't lock her up. He didn't lock her in the cell. She said she just set out in the, uh, in the jail car. And uh, she said, your mom didn't know what was going on. She was just dancing and whatever. And so they were not disrespectful or, or mean to her. They just, you know, held her there. So the next morning, I think it was when, I believe it was sometime in between that time and the next morning, she did get the call or wire home. The next morning, my grandfather saw her and my grandmother's oldest brother came to uh, bail her out, to go to court and, and, and bail her out. So, uh, when they went before the judge, I think, he gave her the maximum, which was $500, $500 I think it was, plus whatever, whatever the, the cost of the court. And he said something smart to her about the fact that if he could charge her more, he would. And on the way back to, I guess, to, she had to go back to the jail. She said, the younger cop said to the older cop, where do those in the inward get $500 from this time of the morning? The bank's not even open. And the older cop said to the younger cop, well, do you see how the little girl was dressed? Do you see how she was dressed? Do you see the earrings that she was wearing? He said, that's why they put it in the cell. So, and these are the earrings. I have them that my grandmother wore. She got those for her 21st birthday from, my, from her father. So those were the earrings that she had on that day. And, and we heard this story throughout our life, especially my sister and, I, and my cousin and I. Whenever we were going somewhere and my grandmother was not pleased with what we were wearing, and she would always tell us that story. So we would go and change clothes. But you know, the, the moral of that story stayed with us for a long time. But the bigger moral was, the stand up rights. So, why do you think Blanche and her sister contacted the NAACP in New York, who represented Blanche in her lawsuit against the Atlantic Coast Line and the Port and Porter Company? Because Jim Crow was effective in Florida, so that basically there was nobody in Florida who was going to handle that case. So that, that is why um, Aunt Catherine did it in, in, in New York City, filed a complaint in New York City on, on behalf of my, my grandmother. My grandmother was a plaintiff, but she found it there because at that time, uh, Florida was a Jim Crow state. So why are her attorneys significant? For example, Clarence Darrow uh, and the famous Scopes trial of 1925. Why do you think? What significance did these attorneys represent in this story? I think basically what they saw at the time was that there was a need for a changing of the guard. There, there was a need to stop what was going on. And when you have people that powerful, especially when you were dealing with parents, attorney parents there, who was uh, famous for the, the monkey scope trial, 
taking part of it, and then you had Arthur Hayes, you, uh, uh, Arthur Garfield Hayes. So you had all these people taking an interest in this is wrong. This is something we need to stop. Uh, people had died during the Civil War. People had died, and during the, during the the 1910s and 1920s, you had people who were around blacks who were around their property and who were lynched. So I think they saw it, it was a time and a need for change. In 1927, what was the outcome of your grandmother's uh, lawsuit, and what was the legal reason uh, for awarding her with that money? The, the outcome was that she won. I think they had sued for twenty-five thousand. I think they, I think that the final award was something like twelve fifty. Uh, 1250. But I think basically uh, the significance of that was I think that that was the first time that anybody had challenged um, that Jim Crow law in the South with, uh, regarding public transportation. And I think, and she won. And I think the significance of that is that basically it was a landmark case. It's something that basically um, will always be in, in the books that this was the first test case especially dealing with that. And then it also dealt with um, with a woman who was six months pregnant with a two year old child who said, hey, I'm not gonna take this. And I think that was that was the most significant thing. Not that it was it wasn't staged, it wasn't planned, it wasn't anything. That was her belief, her right her will to say she's by herself. This is I'm not going. I'm not going to let you turn me around. I'm not going to be. Stuck. What impact did your grandmother Blanche and other strong women and men have on you and your sister Renee? Can you tell us sometimes when you and your sister stood up for yourselves and for what was right? Yes, I can. Um, I can remember when they we. We have a library that was right across the street from the center where we are now. It was next to uh, the elementary school was right there on the corner, then the library, and then the center. And um, someone had, had donated money to build a library here so that the black students would have some place to, to, to go to the library. And we went over there one, one afternoon after school. And we were doing a, a project, my, my girlfriend and I were doing a homework for a civics assignment. At the time, I, I was at, we were at homework, it was in ninth grade. And they didn't have the literature or whatever that we needed to, to finish our project. So we came home from the, came home from the library and we got to the defense and said, no, they didn't have what we needed. So she proceeded to tell us, well, you walk right down to the library downtown which at that time was right there next to the church on, on Lyman. Um, and and uh, tell them, give them your address. I'm a taxpayer, so if anybody asks you any questions, so I'm, a, I'm a taxpayer. So off we went, off my sister Renee and, and my girlfriend Judy and I, off we went to the Little Park Library. And we did our research. But, uh, found our answers, and then we decided, well, we wanted to check out some books. So then we went uh, to check out books. So one of the librarians decided she was going to pull out the calendar, pull out the uh, map of, of Winter Park to find out where we stayed, where we stayed in the city limits. And uh, we showed her where we were on the map. And so she still didn't want to give us the library card to the other library day. We had to give it to them. So we got our, little, our, our books and we came on home. I think there was an article in the, in the paper, the one of our Herald, I think it was about, probably the next week about three little girls when they integrated the um, library last week. And someone asked my mother about it. Do you, know, do you know who those girls were? And my mother said, yeah, Deborah, Renee, and Judy. And she said, who? And my mother repeated it and then she realized Oh, I didn't. She still asked. Oh, I didn't know what your children said. Yep. 
She said, my mother found down there. And that's how that went. But, um, and we were taught that in early age. Um, when they were painting Pennsylvania, well, the, Pennsylvania was already paved, but Pennsylvania had bricks, and they took up the bricks off of Pennsylvania Avenue. I think we were in elementary school at that time. And they waited until we left home, went to the grocery store to move the hedges. We had hedges, if you see the hedges, they go all, on that picture, they go all the way across the front of the yard. So they moved the hedges and just threw them. So when we came back from the grocery store, and my grandmother was with my aunt was driving, and she said, uh-uh. So with groceries in the car, we went down to City Hall and she wanted to see the city manager. And uh, she wanted to know why her hedges had been dug up. So he said, well, they want you to know they're not on your property line. She told him my property line was so much. She said, you had to be on my property. And I wasn't at home. So he gave her some, he gave her some, some back talk about it. So she said, that's okay. She said, I came down here for a courtesy to let you know that I'm getting ready to go. Today you start and have y'all arrested for trespassing. So we had groceries in the car, so we had to come and put the groceries in the car. So by that time, the city manager was at our house before we got to Orlando to the sheriff's office to apologize. So at the, at the end of the summer, when they got through, then they came with some puny looking bushes. And we were home that day, and my grandma said, mm -mm, that's not what you got out of my yard. That's not what you're going to put back in my yard. So he said, well, we can't find our vessels. So she said, um, I can find them for you. So she said, he was in the truck, so she said, come on. So he said, well, you can't take the children. Uh, there's only, uh, the children won't fit up here. Only two people will fit in the truck, you know, in the cab of the mm -hmm. truck. And my grandmother told him, you do not leave the children home by themselves. They're coming with me. So she took him down, we went down to Poole and Florida, and she picked out, I don't know how many adoptions that it was, and she told me, this is what I want. And, and the, the man looked at her. And he said, mm, she said, you had no business on my property to begin with. So they planted her plants back. And that's what we learned. That was our first dealing with her in that manner of making the demanding that they do this. But she would always, when we would always go to the store with her, they had the colored water fountain and the colored bathroom. And she'd always send my sister down to white me. And we did it, because she said to me. So one day, we were in the store, and my mother, my mother couldn't find us. We were my mother. And so we went we, out, we come out of the white bathroom. And she said, you're not supposed to go in the bathroom. She, we said, Grandma, let us go in the bathroom. That's the way Grandma told us to go to. So she said, Mama don't mind going to jail. She said, I'm not going to jail. <laughs> so we just looked at her laugh, but every time we went to the store, we went in the white bathroom and we drank down the white water fountain. But that's what my grandmother told us to do. And that's what we did. So tell me about your experience at Florida State University as being a uh, Early, that was, early uh, oh, that was that was that was that was very interesting. Um, coming from one of our guys, which was basically a, 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 a beautiful experience, and going to Florida State, dealing with with, with overt racism was uh, to say the least. We were the first class of freshmen, um, of blacks who were allowed in the university as freshmen. Uh, most of the blacks who were in Florida State at that time, either in grad school or, or junior college graduates. So my class were, there were nine of us who came in this freshman. 
And so we wanted to start a Black Student Union on campus. So we went through, we went and followed the procedure to the letter, the T. I mean, we needed to get a professor to sign off. At that time, there was a black professor that we did find a black professor to sign off on it. And how many students we had and how. And basically, we got white students to sign too, and so that we had enough students. And we had to take it to the vice president, student affairs. So he met with us. It was about 25 of us who went, and we had spokespeople so that we, you know, we would we not be accused of being disorderly. So when we got to the meeting, and we presented all of our information for him to approve of us to have an organization on campus. And uh, he looked at us, and he said that over his dead body would there be a black student union at Florida State University as long as he was the vice president here. And don't come back anymore. And nobody said anything, that none of the folks people said anything, but uh, and I, I was looking around, and nobody said anything. And I was a freshman at the time. I was 17, I was the first one there. And I had too much grand experience in me, and I just stood up and I told him, my name is Deborah Patricia Kirby. I live in Gilchrist, Donald. I gave him my student number. I told him I was majoring in nursing. And I planned to graduate from Florida State University in four years. My advice to you is that you start planning your funeral now because before I leave this university, there will be a Black Student Union on this campus. And with that, we all walk out. And next year, we have a Black Student Union. And the year after that, we have a Black Student Union house and a Black Student Union budget. And he was still the vice president when I graduated in 1971. So is there anything else you would like to share with us? I just want to talk about the town I grew up in. You know, this this part of this part of the town raised us all. We were raised by a village in this community. It, it started out with Sunday school. It started out with church. It started out with, with, with just the love that was here. In the summertime, we didn't have boys and girls clubs, but we had, we had Bible schools. At, there were six or seven churches here. Each one of those churches scheduled their Bible schools at a different week so that all during the summer we had somewhere to go in, in the room. The women took off from their jobs and they were there. They cooked. They fed us lunch. We were there from what, 8, 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning to, until after 12 in the afternoon. So, that the, so, and we learned about God. But we learned about each other. We learned about giving. We learned about love. We learned about doing the right thing. You can grow up to be whatever you want to be. If no one, a very few people had cars, but those people who did have cars would take children wherever. The churches took you to the beach, or the parents took you to the beach, or they took your friends to the beach, they took you to football games. They, they just showed you all kinds of love. And you don't really appreciate it until you, you get away from it. And then if you find out the things that you take for granted, because you think everyone has that same kind of love, that that's not true. A lot of communities did not have what we had here. And I think that is one of the things that I'll always live in my heart. The fellowship of my family, because our door, our doors at our home, was never locked. 
And now I forget we were going to the beach. We were going to be gone for a week. Nobody knew where the key was. So we never locked the door. We were going to be gone for a whole week. The door wasn't locked. So we just put a brick behind the door and went on by that. We never locked the door. If it was raining and your clothes were on the line, when you came home, somebody had put them in the house. That's kind of, and this, this is the kind of, of neighborhood we grew up in. And that's what you miss. We, everybody knew that we ate at 6 o'clock. So if, if somebody wanted to eat uh, or whatever, they showed up. They knew on Sundays we ate at 2 o'clock. On holidays we ate at 2 o'clock. There was probably maybe maybe uh, 10 or 12 people in the family that would eat at the holiday, yeah, holiday dinner. But our holiday dinners was always about 25 or 30 people there. They weren't invited. They just came and told everybody to eat. And that's, that's love. That's the love that, that people have for each other. And that's the one thing that I can say that I appreciate and that makes you who you are. And they taught us to give back. They taught us to give back. I can remember my grandmother volunteered a job for us one summer. She had my sister and I take, we started out with four uh, kids that we would take downtown to the colony to, um, on Wednesday morning to the movies for the children. We, we, my sister, we were in junior high at that time. So most of them, the kids were elementary school, kindergarten. By the time we got through, that summer was about 17 kids. And she would give us, my grandmother would give us rolls of quarters to take them to the movies. And finally, I think after about 17, I said, Grandma, please don't find anybody else for us to take the movie. But to this day, I do not go to the movies. I mean, the, I mean, those kids were loud, screaming, yelling. And one lady came and said about me one day, and she said, do you have a civil service? And I said, no. She said, I see y'all here with these kids and they're so quiet. She said, how y'all get them to be quiet? I said, we tell them if they don't mind, we're not going to wear them anymore. So we didn't have any problem with our group. But it was the law. And, that's what, and that's, that's what made me who I am. And I tried to give back to the community the way that this community gave me. So you, do you think that type of community exists now or can exist in the future with gentrification? Do you think that those people... I think people? that's one of the things that, that, that's missing. I think that's one of the things. Um, I think that's, that's why we have the lost feeling. That's why we have people who feel that they are lost and they're left out. Because, because they are. You know, any, if, you, if you look at any society that survives and thrives, it survives and thrives from everybody working together. But when you, when you isolate people, when you take people, and you basically have just that one economic group in a certain area, and they're all by themselves, we grow and we learn from each other. If you take an average student and put them in a class with, the, with children that excel, that average student is going to work up to that level. So if you take people who are, who are at the poverty level and you leave them by themselves, or you take communities and, and divide them up, then basically we're not sharing. Because each of us brings our own values, we, but we, each of us brings something to the table. And we can all learn and grow from each other. A society of people that basically excel, a, a society of people who work and grow together from all aspects because of the fact that we all have to learn that we might be going in the same direction by a different path. We all, all have our same goals. But we learn from each other on how to get there. We learn from each other because all of us brings our heritage. We bring our heritage to the table. And this is what basically we were built on. 
even though sometimes we forget that. But we were built, we are not about people. And that's what made us different, and that's what made us great in our heydays. Right now, I don't know. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, but Deborah, thank you so much for sharing those rich stories about the Washington Sampson Stroder and, and Edith Wilson Stroder family. Um, I mean, this is really great. Thank you so much. I'm proud. I, I'm proud to say that I'm a member of, of, of the family. It, um, and I, I don't have any offspring. So I hope it doesn't die out with, with, with my generation. Donna had, you know, my cousin Donna had some offspring, and my cousin Ronnie had some offspring. So those are my grandmother's uh, four grand, you know, great grandchildren. So hopefully we'll keep it going. Now on the uh, uh, on the uh, the stronger side there, there are quite a few. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, would you please uh, just tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here at these artifacts? Okay. Now these are a part of the Heritage Collection here at the Heritage Museum. This was this is a a, a portrait, a family portrait of my uh, great grandparents, the Strawders. That's Edith Strawder. This is Washington Strawder. This is. My grandmother, Blanche Brookins, their eldest daughter. This is Catherine Strother Moore. This is Arthur Strother. That's William Strother, and that's Myrtle Strother, their youngest daughter. And this is Wallace Brookins, Blanche Brookins' second second child who gave this picture and story to the museum. And the next picture is of my grandmother around the age of what, 24, 25. That's Blanche Brookins. And this is the starter house that's 317 Pennsylvania Avenue, which is basically in the parking lot, right, right, right across from the Heritage Center at Face Pennsylvania Avenue. And this was a house that was built after the original one was burned. Now what we have here are basically um, some artifacts from this, the lawsuit. We have the District Court of Appeals to the, uh, the District Court of Appeals of the Southern District of New York. This basically talks about um, the trial and the outcome of the trial. An article, this is an article that was published in the Crisis Magazine in February 1927 about the out outcome of the trial. This is, a, these are, this is an article, another article about the Southern Railway passenger ejected from the train. So it talks about my grandmother being ejected from the train. And this is a uh, a copy of all of the cases of Clarence Darrow. It's federal cases. And on the back, in 1927, it states the NAACP reported that in December 1926 that Arthur Garfield Hayes filed a lawsuit on behalf of Blanche S. Brookings a black woman against the Pullman Company and the Atlantic Coast Line, and that uh, Clarence Dara agreed to serve on that case. And there's some more newspaper articles. And also, here we have the um, letter from Arthur Garfield Hayes that's stating that he's going to help. This is from um, 
Here's the summons for the Jim Crow case in Crisis Magazine. And the outcome. Excellent. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And this is when the house is torn down. All right, thank you.